Our first presenter is Kristen Hoying. Kristen is a parent of a former Gillen High School student who lost her life to the disease addiction. Here is Kristen and our summer story. Thank you, Emory. Thursday, January 8th, 2015, at 7.54 a.m. was my last conversation with my daughter. I called her to check in like I always do and to talk about a sweater. Six days later, I buried her in that same sweater. I struggle to remember if my last words to her were I love you, as they usually were. Let me take you back a bit. Summer's Gilderlin High School graduation. The possibilities would be endless after this. What would the next step be? A job? College? What career would she choose? Somehow, the words heroin addict didn't come to my mind as a possibility. However, that is exactly the words that were being spoken to me during a phone call in May of 2002. I'll never forget the day, a beautiful spring day, sitting alone in my house when the phone rang. One of Summer's close friends was on the phone. I think you need to know, Summer has a problem with heroin. The floor crashed out from beneath me, and the hell that is known only to someone struggling with addiction and to their families began. Let's go back a bit further. Summer was a beautiful young child, full of life and spirit, always happy, always smiling, impish, and a bit stubborn. Life was good. Then in fourth grade, Summer disclosed that a very traumatic event had been occurring in her life. She was a victim of child sexual abuse. She was abused by someone very close to her, someone she loved and trusted. Life was never the same for Summer. Although she received counseling for many years, the whole structure of her life had changed, including her perception of herself. Little did I know that Summer began experimenting with alcohol at the tender age of nine years old. I didn't have it in my home, so I never assumed she had access. I only became aware when she shared this with me when she was 30 years of age. Let's move forward. The middle school years came quickly. Although many days were wonderful, the pain that she carried on the inside often found its way to the outside. Making it tougher than others as she struggled with her inner feelings of shame and low self-worth. At 12 years of age, Summer spent time in a local residential facility trying to cope with her feelings. By 14, she became suicidal with several half-hearted attempts to take her own life. During this period, she spoke these words, Mom, I think I need help. I've been getting high and I can't stop. I immediately took her to a counseling center where she successfully completed the outpatient program. So proud when she received her one-month coin. Summer then assuring me all was well, we move forward. Memories of family vacations, trips to Disney World, visits with family in Florida, these were our happy memories. A stay at an inpatient treatment center when Summer was having a difficult time coping, a visit to the crisis prevention unit at Albany Medical Center, these were our difficult memories. Summer was a smart young lady, although she challenged her teachers, and Maria as well, she was a first year teacher when she had summer, and pushed my patients to the limits in every way imaginable. She successfully graduated from Gilderland High School in the spring of 2000. Summer became a young mother in the year following graduation. Her son was her pride and her joy. Her love for him was apparent in her every move until that fateful day that I received the phone call. When I look back now, knowing what I know, I can acknowledge that the disease of addiction had taken control of Summer's life. Her love for her son was not any less, however, the power of the disease was too great. Summer once told me, Mom, I was an addict before I even knew I was. Looking back, it's no wonder, if you shake my family tree, the alcoholics will come rolling out. Alcoholism is present throughout the past century. My father struggled his entire life with the disease of addiction and alcoholism. And I recently discovered that my grandfather, whom I never met, who had died at 36, when I read the death certificate, it indicated that he had died of alcoholism and cirrhosis of the liver. The odds were stacked against Summer before she even drank her first drink 
or picked up her first drug. I couldn't even begin to imagine the pain that my daughter was in, what the nightmare of addiction was like for her. All I could relate to was the pain that I was in, the sadness of watching my son watch his sister slip away, and the longing in my grandson's eyes every time we said goodbye to his mother after a visit. I was scared for her, wanting to help her and not knowing the right thing to do, helping to care for her children when she could not, loving her despite the addiction. The choice that I made was to keep going, day by day, hoping and praying that one day she would be successful in recovery, living the life she so deserved, providing support and guidance when she was sober and ready, and backing off when helping her would have been enabling. Summer wanted to be sober. She never wanted her life to be lived struggling with addiction. Let me share her own words that she wrote while in Columbia Memorial Hospital in 2007. Today was one of the most difficult days of my life. I'm not sure what to do or even say. I'm so depressed, lonely, and lost. I've let everyone down who loves me, just like I've always done. But this time, it's much worse. I actually tried to kill myself. Not just for attention, but to die. What was I thinking? I have a wonderful little boy. I brought him into this world, and he needs me. Who else's job is it to take care of him? I mean, really. Of course, there are others that do and will always be willing, but it's my job. No matter what's going on in my life, I need to get it together, if not for myself, but for my son. I'm sick and tired of this lifestyle. Yes, it's fun at times and it feels good, but for what, an hour maybe or two? Why jeopardize my life, my family, and my future for a high? It sounds so stupid, but it's not that easy to do. Today I learned that you can't trust people that you think you can. Most people are really only in it for themselves, which of course is a shame. I wish that it was easy or at least simpler. God didn't intend it to be that way though. All that I do know is that I can do whatever I want. It will take time, but I can get there. Just take it one day at a time and never give up. My mom came today. We had a wonderful visit. I miss that. I miss the old days. I'm not sure if we could ever get them back, but I'm hoping that we can. I miss my brother so very much. We used to be so close. Now he's so distant. I'm not sure what to do. Everything is happening so fast. Do I go back to rehab for the fourth time, which never works? It only gets me more connects or a shelter. Or do I go back to Kevin? No one who knows both of us wants us to be together because they don't think it's healthy. I need someone who will love me no matter what, won't judge me or call my family on me, work with me, grow with me, love me. Why can't I find that? I always find the wrong guys and settle for them. Maybe it's because of my past or maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just effed up. All that I know is I used to be the sweetest, nicest little girl there ever was. And someone took that away. Along with that, they took my life. I want it back, and I'm willing to fight for it till no end, for myself and for my son. I'm trying so hard. Please, God, help me out and forgive me of all my wrongdoings. I'm better than that, and I know that. The years following this journal entry being written were horrific for Summer. She made the decision to go back to the unhealthy relationship, which only compounded Summer's feelings of low self-worth. Her past wounds from her childhood sexual abuse were reopened. The relationship ended as Summer predicted, and Summer once again turned to what she knew to dull the pain, drugs. Summer disappeared for a time, and after many months, we found out that she was living on the streets in Hudson. These were some of the darkest days of Summer's life. During this period, I had to make the difficult decision not to enable my daughter. I couldn't rescue her. She had to rescue herself, which meant taking phone calls on cold winter nights when I could hear her walking on the street, feet crunching in the snow, paranoid from the use of drugs, thinking that the one who had victimized her was after her once again, trying to encourage her to go to the local hospital ER to seek help, 
praying that they wouldn't turn her away if she managed to get herself there, as they had done so many times before, as being just an addict. Knowing that if I got in my car to pick her up, she would be gone before I even got there. Although I don't support the criminalization of addiction, during this period I relied on the criminal justice system to keep track of Summer and prayed that she would get arrested and end up in jail so I would know where she was at night and that she was alive. I wrote a letter to the local judge in Hudson begging him to sentence her to jail and then to a long-term treatment program, stating that if he did not do this, I feared for her life. We were blessed. Summer was arrested and touched the heart of the local district attorney, who did her best to deal with Summer with mercy and treatment in mind. She had a family member herself who struggled with addiction and was the first person that I knew to treat Summer as if she had a disease and not a moral failing. Summer began the next seven years of her life attempting to live a life in recovery, trying to get sober. During this period, she met a wonderful man and had two more children, two boys, whom she loved deeply. Together, along with her older son, they became the reason that she continued to fight this battle. She became very involved with AA, and she surrounded herself with sober friends. Periods of total sobriety were interlaced with relapses that would drag her back into the depths of addiction, and stints in rehabs would bring her back to the surface, struggling every moment. In the fall of 2012, Summer was doing very well. She had just lived a life of total sobriety, she was in her own apartment in Scotia. Her children were back in her life on a weekly basis when she had a relapse. I'll never understand why it occurred that day. Everything was going so well. All she wanted was right in front of her for the grasping. People I've spoken with agree with what I call create a crisis. When things are going well for people who are living in recovery, it's often frightening. It's a new way of living. What if you can't keep it up? What if you can't succeed? Instead of waiting for the ax to fall, go ahead and create the crisis yourself. Summer's relapse involved the use of crack cocaine. When she used crack cocaine, she became paranoid and fearful. Fearful that her abuser was coming after her. She heard a knock on the door of her apartment building, thinking it was the drug dealer who had just pushed her down three flights of stairs in Schenectady. He had done so because he hadn't seen her in so long because she was clean that he thought she had ratted him out. In her paranoid state, she ran out of her front door, burst through the apartment door directly across from hers, and then ran straight through their closed plate glass window, nearly losing her life. This was the crime that would lead her to a felony charge for criminal mischief and the opportunity to choose drug court. Summer had many conversations with me about her decision to join drug court. She knew it would be the harder road for her, that she could just serve her time for the crime that she was convicted of, and go back to her old life. But she wanted control of her life back. She told me, I'm choosing drug court because I can't stand to live in the hell of addiction anymore. Summer wanted to live. If any one of you personally knew Summer, you would know that she was larger than life. If Summer was in a room, you would know it. She wore every emotion she had on her sleeve and would make you aware of it, good or bad. There was never a doubt that you knew where you stood with her. She loved God, her family, and her three children with all of her heart. Her desire was to live her life in recovery, drug, and alcohol free. I was never prouder of Summer than when she elected to participate in Schenectady County Drug Court. This decision gave her and our family one of the best years of our life together. It was a slippery slope at times, three steps forward, one step back, but ultimately she kept heading towards her goal one step at a time. We were reunited as a family. Summer was an active mother of her children. And in the spring of 2014, Summer chose to join a Couch to 5K training program, which was being offered at the Schenectady YWCA, where Summer was a resident in the Women's Housing Program. This training program was being offered by the nonprofit group STEM, Strong Through Every Mile. Summer made a choice to do something positive, healthy, and empowering for herself. The day of the race arrived, a freezing cold snowy day in December. The moment that Summer crossed the finish line in the pouring rain and sleet was a moment that I will never forget. Smiling, never giving up, she had run every step of the way, and she had done so in honor of her grandmother. Like every other day of her life, I was proud of Summer, 
However, this day was a step above the rest. It wasn't always easy, and she wasn't always successful at the tasks and challenges. Relapses occurred, but she continued to fight the battle. Instead of pain and disappointment, we once again shared laughter and love and many, many hugs. I never let her leave my car when I was dropping her off at the Y without saying I love you and demanding a hug. After a while, I stopped having to demand the hugs, and they were freely given. In 2012, she spent Christmas in jail. In 2013, Christmas was celebrated in a rehab facility. And in 2014, Christmas was spent surrounded by her family, forgiven by her brother, holding her three boys in her arms, and giving presents to everyone. She was so proud that this year she could give and not just take. Her Christmas card had the word peace on it, and in it she promised me that she would give me peace in the new year. That month of December 2014 was amazing, celebrating our first Christmas together in three years, at home laughing and making memories with her children. She was home for my birthday and her oldest son's 13th birthday. For my birthday, she, I, and my husband went to a concert in Troy, a beautiful snowy night, memories I'll never forget. Fast forward a few weeks to another beautiful snowy day. Here are some words written about that day. The body of a 31-year-old female presents for autopsy. The body is identified by the attached name tag and is received in a blue bag with a seal attached to the bag. The body is clothed in a red long sleeve t-shirt and blue pants. Multiple tattoo marks are found to be present. The words Caden, Anthony, and Richie are tattooed on her left and right ankles with baby feet. These are Summer's children's names. The words to thine own self be true are tattooed on the upper chest area. For those of you who don't know, the famous Shakespearean words from the play Hamlet are found on coins given by AA to celebrate anniversaries of time and recovery without a drink or a drug. These words simply mean to be loyal to one, one's own interests in a positive way. Take care of yourself first, and then you'll be in the position to take care of others. This was Summer's way of reminding herself. How did this happen? Things were going so well. What I can piece together is that Summer, who was working with a therapist regarding her past childhood sexual abuse, decided to reach out to confront the one who had abused her. Instead of receiving the I'm sorry that she so longed to hear for her whole life, he treated her with disdain and told her that she had ruined his life. To cover the pain that she felt, Summer once again sought refuge in what was familiar, trying to skirt the issue of hard drugs and fooling herself that she was okay, she began to drink again and use synthetic marijuana, specifically spice. On January 9th, Summer suffered a relapse that her body could not survive. Summer and I had planned to attend a church service that Sunday with her brother. Instead, I attended alone with Daniel, standing side by side, clinging to each other and weeping. Ironically, the sermon that was preached was called Being Free, and the verses that day were from Romans 7. The words shared seemed to come directly from Summer, and I chose to have them read at her funeral. In the weeks after her death, I comforted myself reading Summer's Bible, and in it I found that those same verses had been underlined and read by Summer herself. I'd like to share them with you. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Although I am filled with sorrow, and sometimes I feel that I cannot breathe without my daughter in my life, I do have the peace of knowing that she's free from the disease of addiction and her struggle is over. She is truly free at last. Why have I taken the time to share my family story with you today? 
in the hopes that by sharing Summer's story, we as a community can work to reduce the stigma surrounding addiction. Begin to recognize addiction as a disease, just like any other chronic disease, such as cancer or diabetes, and to hopefully start a conversation between parents and children before it's too late. And for those of you who have walked the same road and shared the same journey as my family, so that you know you're not alone. I recently listened to a father speak on the internet who had lost his son to heroin. I'll never forget his words. It's not my child until it is. The irony in Summer's story is she didn't die of a heroin overdose, as so many have assumed. Summer fought long and hard to win her battle with heroin and was successful. However, the disease of addiction remained with her long after she shot up for the last time. Heroin was replaced with other substances, primarily cocaine and alcohol. I share this not because one drug is better or safer or carries less stigma than another, but because I want us to focus on the fact that long before this current epidemic of heroin overdoses that we face, the disease of addiction existed. And long after this current epidemic fades from the public's eye and is not the story of the moment for reporters, this disease will exist, slowly taking its victims down one by one. Addiction must be a public health concern on both the local and national level that we deal with just as we deal with any other chronic health issue. A culture of recovery and supports for recovery must be created throughout each state so that we can successfully save lives. Victims of trauma must be treated with appropriate treatment prior to the disease of addiction being taken over. Per recent published studies and surveys of adolescents receiving treatment for substance abuse, more than 70% of the patients had a history of trauma exposure. Among treatment-seeking women with substance abuse, rates of physical and sexual abuse are high, ranging from 55 to 99%. And specifically to our veterans, nearly three-quarters of those surviving violent or abusive trauma report substance abuse disorders. In Summer's memory, I've established the Summer Smith 5K Addiction Awareness Memorial Run, which is an annual event. Our first run was held on May 14th, 2015, right here at Gilderland High School. My goal in creating this race was to honor my daughter's memory, to bring attention to the disease of addiction, and to reduce the stigma surrounding this disease so that those who suffer do not suffer alone in silence. So that families such as yours and mine don't need to attend overdose awareness vigils, and we may attend weddings and birthdays and family celebrations instead. Our intention is to provide prevention, education, and awareness through this event. What a wonderful day it was. We had over 300 walkers and runners the day of the race, and we raised over $21,000, which we donated after the, uh, after the race itself cost. We donated over $13,000, which is donated to the Schenectady YWCA to help women in recovery with their housing needs, and also to the Addictions Care Center of Albany, to help support the provision of community education regarding the disease of addiction. We invite you to join us here this year at Gelderland High School. The event is going to be held on Saturday, May 13th. You can either pre-register online or here this evening if you're interested. If you would prefer to register the day of the race, the registration will open at 8 a.m. that morning. The memory ceremony will be at 8.50 with a race start time of 9.30. It's a great day. It is filled with great spirit. We have a bounce house and we have fun runs for children under the age of 12, in addition to the main walk and run. We have many exhibitors that are there to provide education about the disease of addiction and to offer support and resources. This year we're adding a post-run chicken barbecue that will begin at 11 o'clock. You can purchase your tickets on runsignup.com in the store area under Summer's Race. We will also have a booth there where you can help raise money by getting a purple hair extension it's the color of recovery, and it's one of Summer's favorite colors. I'd like to close today with words that were written by Lauren Trunco, the housing coordinator at the Schenectady YWCA housing program, who ran side by side with Summer at her first 5K run. These words were collected to be placed in a memory book for Summer's children. Richie, Anthony, and Caden. Your mom had the most infectious laugh and smile. She made no apologies for who she was, and she didn't have to. Summer had a heart of gold with jewelry to match. Your mom was so kind to everyone. One of the older women who lived at the Y couldn't afford a winter coat. Without telling anyone, your mom went out and bought her one so she wouldn't be cold. 
That's the kind of woman that your mother was. I had the privilege of seeing how happy and cheerful she was after she would see you boys. It would recharge her soul and give her purpose in the moment. Your mom and I also ran a race together on December 6, 2014, called the Jingle Bell Run. Her and I, side by side, pushing through the pain, the rain, and the freezing cold wind on our faces. She pushed me, and I pushed her, especially as we reached the finish line. Such is life. When you don't know what else to do, and you aren't sure you can go on, just put one foot in front of the other, feel the cool breeze on your face, and think of your mom. You will reach your finish line. Thank you. Now we would like to welcome Andrew McKenna to share his personal struggle with the disease of addiction. Andrew McKenna was Marine Corps Captain, JAG Attorney and Justice Department Prosecutor to opiate and heroin addict, addict, bank robber, and ultimately to federal prisoner. Mr. McKenna's descent and eventual rise as told in his memoir, Sheer Madness, is astonishing in its brutal honesty and candor, and is an inspiration to those struggling with depression and addiction, delivering a powerful message of hope and redemption. Please come welcome Andrew McKenna. I remember sitting in a chair in an apartment in the stockade in Schenectady, New York. And I couldn't move my, my legs and I couldn't really move my upper body. I was just sat in this comfortable chair. And across from me was a friend of mine that had been a friend for 25 plus years. And he was turning blue. We had just used heroin together it affected me in such a way on that day where I couldn't move, I was paralyzed. And I couldn't get up and try to wake him up. Because he was just blue and he was overdosing and it was just before the days of Narcan, not that I would have had Narcan anyhow, because I was too far gone. But as I watched, I said to myself, God, let me move, let me feel my feet, let me get up, let me help my friend. You know, to this day, I really can't get that image out of my face. I remember the next thing I am, I'm sitting in my car, and it's a rainy night, like early evening, and I had the windshield wipers on, and his apartment's right there, and he's inside in his chair dead, and I made it out of my chair. Right? But I couldn't help him because he was already dead. So what I did was I called 911 and then left the apartment and went and sat in my car and then watched the paramedics from Schenectady come, take him out of his apartment, on the gurney, his head covered, gone. Two weeks later, I'm sitting in my car in Albany, downtown Albany, and I feel the steel of a gun barrel on my temple. What I had done was I'd gone to Albany to buy heroin. And I found somebody on the, on the street that I kind of identified as a, probably a dealer or somebody who would know a dealer. And he got in the car and he started to hand me what I asked him for, which was a couple bundles of heroin. At this point, my addiction had spiraled so far out of control. I was so far gone. I was using so much just to survive. And that cold barrel, I can still feel it right now as I'm speaking to you. And so, right the seconds before that barrel hit my temple, I reach into my pocket. I don't know he has a gun within these few seconds. And I take out my cash, right? And he goes and he grabs the cash with one hand and points the gun at my temple. And then the next sound I hear wakes me up at night. It's the clicking of a jamming weapon. And I know what that sounds like because I was in the Marines and I used to go to the range and fire my nine millimeter and it's a metal on metal sound when the weapon jams. For whatever reason, he decided that he was gonna shoot me. 
and it jammed. I was able to do all this, kick. He got out of the car. I proceed on to um, a convenience store. I'm soaked from the waist down because I had gone to the bathroom. That's my level of fear. That's how close I came to death that day. It was right there. Fast forward two more weeks. I'm driving from Rensselaer County to Schenectady to buy heroin. I'm on I-90 uh, coming west. Rush hour traffic, cool fall day, sunny blue skies. And in my rearview mirror are police cars, and not just one or two, like 12. And there's a blacked out SUV, and I'm just cruising down, you know, rush hour traffic, as I said, because I need heroin, and I need it bad, and I need it right now. And if I could transport myself directly to Schenectady without having to drive there, I would, do, and I would, I would sell my soul to be able to do that. Overhead, there's a helicopter. And I write about this in the book because the, the distinct whooshing sound of the rotors, of course, I know that from the Marine Corps, that was there for me. And that wasn't a Marine Corps helicopter, right? That was state police. And they, had the, they found their guy. I'd just gotten done a few minutes earlier robbing my sixth and final bank. And I'm driving, and there's a median. And I see it, and I think to myself, if I drive as fast as I can directly into that median, I'll kill myself. No more sadness, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more worrying about the children that I just lost in the custody battle, right? Where the family court judge called me a junkie in open court. No more of that. No more waking up in the morning wondering how I'm going to get high that day. Who am I going to steal from? Who am I going to borrow from? Who am I going to beg from? Also, I don't get sick that day. Because that's my goal at this point in my addiction, is just not getting sick. You know, on the chance that I use a little bit extra and have a little bit more money and catch a little buzz and get a little bit high, that's all gravy. I just don't want to get sick. I don't want to throw up. I don't want the bugs crawling on my skin. I don't want the shakes. I don't want the fear, the sleeplessness. So I have this decision to make. I can end it all right here. And I even remember undoing my seatbelt. I remember the seatbelt dangling on my arm as I'm driving towards this median pylon, basically cement, and something reaches out to me and says, don't do it. Don't do this. Now, I don't know if this was my higher power, you know, a universal energy. Um, maybe it was my two little three, my three-year-old and my two-year-old secretly communicating with me. It was probably my fear, although I didn't rationalize this at the time, because at this time I couldn't rationalize anything in my life. It could have been my fear that my children would blame themselves when they grew up, because I couldn't see them anymore. You know? And I know that they kind of wondered when we met, that one hour a month that the judge allotted us, you know, why isn't dad coming home with us? Or why is he going this way and we're going this way? And that always haunted me every day, all through those years, or, or days of using drugs. You know, that's one of the major things I was trying to get away from, was that sadness and that depression. Something speaks to me. I decide not to do it. Next thing I know, I'm on the side of the highway, boxed in. Okay, to my left is about eight, ten feet away is a young state trooper, and he's got his sidearm trained on me. Young guy, I remember his face. I actually tried to go through police reports and reach out to him, and he was shaking like a leaf. Right, and he's saying, "Keep your hands where I can see him, Andrew." So he knows my name. Clearly, I've been under investigation. You know, because I just went on a crime spree for six or seven weeks, you know, robbing banks in New York, Vermont, Massachusetts. I was just going crazy. I was crazy. The disease of addiction had driven me to a point where I would act completely inconsistent with any rational value system. That's how I know it's a disease. It's one of the main reasons I know this is a disease and it's not a moral failing, right? I'm not a criminal but I was doing criminal acts. I was responsible, ultimately, from day one until the day I got caught and thereafter. So now they got me down on the ground, you know, wrists yanked behind my back, knee in my, in my back, you know, searching through my pockets, any sharps, any sharps, any sharps, which is a needle, right? And I said, I don't know. And I didn't know. I didn't know what was in my pockets. I didn't know 
anything anymore. I didn't know what these thoughts, how I was acting the way I was acting. And all of a sudden, the trooper gets stuck with the needle that's in my pocket. And no first responder, nobody wants to get stuck with a needle, but first responders, they deal with this stuff day in and day out. And I could easily, very easily have had a disease, given the lifestyle that I, you know, ultimately landed in through my own actions. So now the, the handcuffs become a lot tighter because he's angry and that knee gets a little deeper. And he says, any more needles, any more needles? And I said, I don't know. I remember my face is sort of on the side of the road as he's got, he's got me all cuffed up and he's searching me and um, a tear rolls out of my eye because I had fallen about as far as anybody possibly could have fallen. You know, and I see a Volvo, old, late model Volvo that my wife would drive and put the kids in the back and that comes by and it's the same color, little kids in the back seat and they weren't my children, you know, but they very well could have been and then the cars just kind of creep by and everybody's staring at me. Next thing I know, I'm at the state trooper barracks, handcuffed to the wall, and now the withdrawals are really starting to kick in. The rapid heart rate, uh, the perspiration, the throwing up. Hadn't thrown up yet, but it was coming any minute. And once that starts, folks, it goes on for days. And there's a couple of ways to stop that, okay? And heroin is one of them. So when we talk about people not being able to kick the habit, Let's put that in a little bit of perspective, all right? Because you can, you can have the flu times 50 and be on a bathroom floor in your own vomit and urine and excrement, or you can spend $3 and feel better. That's why it's so difficult to kick it. Luckily, now we have other options and other solutions, um, and detox facilities are operating at a higher level, not where they need to be, but we're seeing solutions to that problem. So back at the station, they start showing me photographs, right, of the bank surveillance stills, and they got some video, and I got the FBI agent here, and the you know, young guy buttoned up, good looking, and then I got the old you know, salty uh, detective. And the pictures, this was my disguise, okay? This is not a disguise, by any means. I had a baseball cap on in a couple of the robberies. So they, she's showing me pictures, and it's me. It exactly looks like me. And I'm saying, you know, I just don't know. That looks a little bit like me. So I'm being a wise ass. The whole time I'm, I'm handcuffed to the wall, right? And these waves of sickness are coming over me. And um, the state trooper says, is there anything that would help you make, make you feel better? And I said, yeah, heroin, right? Which is not the joke he wanted at the time. This was a serious business, but... I was just trying to bring something human, you know, maybe a little bit of laughter, maybe just a second of relief. But of course, they didn't find it funny. The state trooper laughed a little bit. And I said, well, a cigarette would help. And the state trooper knew that cigarettes do not help with withdrawal symptoms, right? But I really needed a cigarette, and I had a hell of a morning, and I needed a smoke. And so ultimately, I got my cigarettes. You know, the, the FBI agent said, no, 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 no. We don't, this is a non-smoking building. This is absolutely absurd. And they, but the trooper wanted my confession, right? That's something that he wanted from me. And so he gave me what I wanted. And I was able to somewhat manipulate the situation. And again, not a rational actor, not a rational thinker, right? I'm trying to get over on these guys trying to do their job. I mean, I had lost everything at this point, you know, everything mentally. But ultimately, they gave me this stuff, and we go out back, and they have me shackled from head to toe, and there's nine of them, and they're all armed. And one of them says, we're not going to have any problems out of you, are we? I'm like, well, there's nine of you with guns, and I'm shackled. And I tell this, if I could possibly headbutt all nine of you and, like, scurry away in my shackles, that's the only way I'm going to give you a hard time. So we went out. I had a couple smokes, go back in, and they want their signature. And I'm not giving them the signature. So I start to lecture them on constitutional law because, yeah, I used to be a federal prosecutor and I would teach it to the agents at Quantico. And of course, I argued the points in court um, as a criminal attorney. Um, and they didn't appreciate that either, right? Who is this snarky 31 year old guy telling us about the Constitution and he doesn't have to sign a confession? So, Anyhow, we go to court for my initial appearance, federal court in Albany. Randolph Treese is the judge. He and I have gotten to know each other 
Now, back then, he just denied me bail. So three times I tried for bail. Well, bank robbers don't get bail. And he wrote a 16-page detention order saying why I shouldn't get bail. So I'm sitting in jail, Albany County Jail, and I don't see Sheriff Apple here. He and I have talked a number of times um, about the food in that place, but we don't need to go there now. Apple doesn't care, and he has a gun. So we, um, so I'm, I'm brainstorming. I got to get out of jail. I don't belong in jail. And so from my cell, I concoct this idea. If I can get, um, come up with a little bit of bail money from some friends that I hadn't robbed yet, and um, set up an appointment with Connor for Park and Troy to do an intake, uh, which is a treatment facility in Troy. I remember calling the woman from jail for my counselor's office, and Lisa Beckett's her name, and ultimately Lisa, um, clearly one of the few people that literally had a hand in saving my life. Um, she said, wait, you're Andrew. I saw you, your thing in the paper about the robberies. And I know you used to practice law, and so, you know, it was a media thing, and people made a big deal out of it. She said, well, how are you going to come <laughs> to treatment in Troy? And I said, oh, no, Lisa, I'm going to get bail. And so she said, okay, I'm going to pencil in an assessment about a month from now. And she was a sweetheart. And then we got the ankle bracelet set up. I set up a, an appointment with a, a psychologist. And now we bring this package back to the jail, to the uh, judge. And he lets me out. And he lets me know before he lets me out, if you screw this up, you'll be right back in. And it's going to affect your ultimate sentence at the end. And he made it very, very clear to me. So what did I do for that year? Well, I kicked heroin on the floor of Albany County Jail. No Suboxone, no Methadone, no Ativan, nothing to take the edge off. Um, I was lucky to get, you know, three squares every day. That's how it used to be run. It's different now under uh, Craig Apple much better. So I kicked heroin, technically kicked it, where I didn't have the physical withdrawals anymore. You know, maybe just slight, but I still had all that junk up here, all that addicted type thinking running through my mind. And so I started doing groups at Conifer Park, and you know, the group size might be 10 or 12 people, process groups, relapse prevention groups. I started to peel back those layers of the onion. And you know what I found, folks? When I was a teenager, and I was here last week with Kristen talking to um, the, the, the class. When I was a teenager, I never developed coping skills. And I see that a lot in kids this age. I have a stepdaughter who's 16 and 14. Um, she's not both ages, there's two of them. <laughs> Finally, a laugh, Jesus. Um, but I've noticed there's a lack of coping skills, and I did that. And this, I, this is a long time ago. I'm the youngest of four, typical, normal family. Dad had a couple pops that night, but nothing got, got, got really crazy. Um, you know, grew up in Schenectady, went to Linton High School, played sports, decent academic, but not great. I was always able to fake a lot of stuff, you know? Um, and teachers, for whatever reason, liked me. So I was always able to kind of squeak through. But inside, I felt down here. Okay, performing sort of up here, outwardly, but inside I felt like crap. I was depressed and didn't know it. I had anxiety and couldn't describe it. I didn't feel good enough about myself, right? I wasn't tall enough. I wasn't fast enough. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't this enough. Didn't have the right friends. Didn't have the right clothes. But outside, I never showed it. Not one indicator. Not one indicator. Never asked for help. Ever. But what I noticed was, at like 13 years old, if I drank a beer or if I smoked a joint, all those feelings went away. Immediately I learned at that age that I could self-medicate. Now we all know if you self-medicate, you're not really working through your issues. And at that age, it's a terrible age not to figure out that what's going on through your head isn't necessarily the truth. Because the reality is for all of us, even as adults, a lot of that negative self-talk just isn't true but it's very easy to self-medicate with the substance. We know that's a house of cards, though. So I take this, this Andrew McKenna as a teenager, no coping skills, I take that into my 20s, right? I go to college, don't know what to do with my life, so I apply to go to law school. That'll, that'll lock me in for three years. I don't have to think about what I want to do. 
After law school, I said, you know, I don't want to be a lawyer in an office, so I joined the Marines. So in the Marine Corps, still no coping mechanisms. At this point, I'm full steam, performing high level, still not feeling right. Always worried that that second shoe is going to drop, or they're going to find out that I'm not smart as, you know, I portray myself to be, right? I'm going to, they're going to find out that I'm a fraud. The fact is, I wasn't a fraud. I just felt like one. You know, but I kept plugging away, kept plugging away. On a training mission in night and land navigation in the Marine Corps, you're out in the woods by yourself going from point A to point B. It's dark. I, I'm terrible at night land navigation. Day in the land nav, I kill it. Nighttime, I had failed the test twice. I had one more time to pass the test. Otherwise, they kick you out of the Marine Corps, basically, because you can't have a Marine that can't lead troops through the woods at night, right? Either that or they put you back in training and then you gotta go get beat up by enlisted guys for like six weeks, it's, it's, it's a horrible experience. So I knew it was a lot of pressure on. So I fall down this cliff, I get entangled in some wire, I trip, my feet slip, I'm tumbling, this is down in the woods of Quantico where there's armadillo and all kinds of weird things. And boom, I come to land on my back on a stump and I kinda lose consciousness for a second. At least I think I do. My lower body, I can't feel anything. and I heard a crack when I landed, so immediately I'm thinking I'm paralyzed. And my mind always goes to the worst case scenario, <laughs> even to today, so I have to keep that under control. But there was a very real moment, and the feeling comes back in my legs, I'm able to climb back up, somehow, miraculously, higher power maybe, I pass the test. I get back to the barracks, my back is shot, it's swollen, I'm in pain, Thank God it was a late on a Friday night. I had two days off where I didn't have to train and I just sat there in bed. And for the next two years or so, I dealt with the pain and this is how I dealt with it. Motrin as directed, heating pad, ice packs. It's exactly how that injury should have been treated. I did the right thing. At that time, you couldn't go to the Marines and say I need a narcotic painkiller. I hadn't even dabbled in that stuff yet, you know, maybe once or twice, and I knew I always liked it, but I wasn't, that wasn't my thing. You know, the other thing was I was physically fit because I was in the Marines, so that took a lot of pressure off the spine, an L4, L5 injury. So then I'm doing great in the Marine Corps, performing up here, coping skills, still not right, a lot of negative self-talk, medicating, self-medicating with alcohol, but maintaining, maintaining. I leave the Marine Corps and go to the Justice Department as a prosecutor. Now, ironically enough, I work for the uh, narcotic and dangerous drug section of the Justice Department. So I flew all over the world in, uh, in, uh, investigating international drug cartels and money laundering, indicting them, bringing them to the U.S., and, you know, having them see justice. And it wasn't just, you know, drug dealers and, like, you know, corner guys and stuff like that. I mean, these were some bad people. Um, two guys out of Cartagena, Colombia, um, high up in their cartel would order their underlings to take enemies or rival drug dealers uh, while they were live and stick them in huge black 100 gallon drums, seal them up with a couple holes and go put them out in a, in a huge field. And they would cook all day in that 110 degree heat. So I'm not talking about real, you know, just people that have drug problems and alternatives to incarceration. I mean, these were dangerous, bad people, and I took great pride in what we were doing. The problem was, as a civilian DOJ prosecutor, I could go to a regular street doctor. Now I'm traveling, I'm flying, hotel food, putting on weight, not exercising, performing like a rock star, still feeling down here. So when I go to that doctor, that civilian doctor in Washington, D.C., and I put my DOJ credentials, the, the black thing with the gold embossment on it, on his desk so he can see it, you know? Because I'm not drug seeking, right? Prosecutors don't drug seek, you know? Doctors, lawyers, teachers, construction workers, blah, blah, blah. No one, none of these people drug seek. Well, especially a guy who's traveling the world prosecuting them. So immediately he says to me, well, we gotta do something about the pain, Andrew. Um, he's an old, old school doctor, super nice guy, just, I don't know, just didn't get the addiction thing. Uh, and he goes, I think I'd like to start you on Percocet. Percocet is oxycodone. It's a very, very powerful opiate. Um, and uh, he says to me, get this, how many do you think you need, right? 
<laughs> and that, you know, that rings in my ear a little bit different than it rings in other people's ear, right? So I figured I'd start the bidding right around 90, yeah? So I left with 90. And instead of taking those over the course of the next three months or next two months, I took those over the course of about the next 10 or 11 days, quickly becoming dependent on Percocet. I screwed something up in the Justice Department. I'm not going to get into it here. Um, I had to leave. They let me go quietly. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what I did. Under the influence of drugs and alcohol, I stole a piece of evidence after a takedown. And, um, you know, affected the integrity of the case. It was almost the lowest point in my life. So they say, you got to go. So I come back up to Albany with my wife, two young kids. I can't find a New York, I get a good job at a law firm in Albany. I can't find a doctor to prescribe me medication up here in New York. Every time I would call, they'd say, well, I can give you five, five milligrams. I'm thinking, geez, I'm doing 20, 10 milligrams a day almost. Um, I had doctors hang up on me. I had doctors say, you need rehab. Please don't call the office anymore. Um, now, withdrawing from an oxycodone or a hydrocodone, Loratab, isn't that bad. A couple of days, you feel uncomfortable, you know. Uh, but eventually, you can, you can push through it. It's really not that bad. Um, I call my buddy, my buddy from second grade, and I say, um, can you get anything for pain? He says, well, I can get OxyContin. Now, folks, OxyContin is heroin in a pill. I was on Fox and Friends not too long ago debating Dr. Keith Ablo about the FDA had just approved OxyContin for children as young as 11 to take them home with them in the little brown bottles that some of our kids in school have in their pockets because they got them from the medicine cabinets. And we're not talking about a hospice setting or a hospital setting or a controlled setting. We're sending, sending them home. And statistically, we know that the kids that are getting hooked on dope are starting with those pills. So when I talk to groups like this in high schools and colleges, I say, throw that stuff out, turn it in really is what you need to do, get it out of the house or put it under lock and key. Because they're getting it, they're sharing it with their friends, they're becoming addicted to it, the pills run out and they're about 40 bucks a pop. You know what a bag of heroin costs now? $3. That's less than a quart of beer. I mean, I don't drink, but I'm, I'm assuming it's right around the same. But what is that kid's option? Opioids are the no feel, no deal drug, right? So when we talk about vulnerability and we look at our middle schools and our high schools, these kids are going through body image issues, the same stuff I went through. Am I good enough, smart enough? You know, am I, am I the right athlete? Am I, do I have the right friends? Am I popular, you know? We go through this stuff as adults, and we just process it like, well, really, who gives a you-know-what, right? But that's not what the kids do. They want that escape, and it's easy to achieve, especially today. Today, now, more than ever. I mean, we're in the midst of an epidemic. For the CDC to call this an epidemic, it has to meet certain requirements. And we don't know, need to know the technical requirements. All we need to know is to open up the newspaper every day or, or turn on Channel 13 or 10 or 6. We know what's happening to our kids and our, and our people in the 20s and 30s and 40s. We know exactly what's happening. So ultimately, I was sentenced to 65 months in federal prison, um, an absolute horror story. It, the levels of violence at the two facilities I was at were just so incredibly high. I'm just going to tell you a quick prison story. I know we have other speakers, um, and then I'm going to make a comment about the hope and the redemption piece. When I was in prison, jail's one thing. You learn not to look in other people's cells, don't gamble, don't do drugs, don't do alcohol, don't have sex, uh, stay out of other people's business, don't gossip. You learn these things because you're going to get the crap beat out of you if you do any of those things and things get crossed up, and they will get crossed up because people in jail are bored and everybody's in everybody else's business. Don't eat the meatloaf on Wednesdays in Albany County. So then I go to prison. It's a completely different story. People are milling around. There's a lot more to do. Um, and I got in there. I was probably there for a week or 10 days. And I look over 
and about maybe mid-row up this thing here, that's the distance, I see this guy stabbing this other guy, right? And he's stabbing him so furiously and so angrily that I can hear the, the shank, the you know, prison knife going in and out of this guy's body. And I'm thinking, oh my God, and there's blood gushing everywhere. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't belong here. This is not where I belong. And I, I'm, I'm standing there and everybody's milling about and I see this and I'm like, it was gang related. And whenever anything like this in prison, federal prison happens that suspected to be gang related, they bring in counselors from all the prisons in the country or a bunch of the prisons. Everybody has to be interviewed because if there's any kind of gang beef, then they can be riots, you know, it's just going to be one revenge killing, one after the other. And so they take it very seriously. So they come into our unit of a few hundred guys, and they sit us all down individually. Now, remember, the rule in prison is you mind your own business, right? And um, so I met with this wonderful woman. I think she was from maybe Massachusetts, a prison there or something. And she said, okay, Andrew, um, do you know anything about this? I said, no, no, I don't know anything. And um, did you see anything? No, I didn't see anything. Do you know if it was gang related? No, I, as I said, I don't know anything about it. And she goes, okay, you didn't see anything, right? Said, no. So she turns the computer monitor around and here's me on tape. Because <laughs> the camera's right there, right? And now I understand why everyone's milling around because they don't want to be a witness to anything. That's the other thing you can't be is a witness to anything because now you're snitching on somebody. Anyhow, I journaled while I was in prison. A psychologist said, you got way too much traffic going on up there. Journaling is a great exercise. I recommend it to everybody I meet with, families, um, especially um, younger kids, young adults. It's just a great way to get what's going on up here down on paper. And then it becomes less real. And now you've been able to identify these feelings and cope with those feelings. That's the key, all right? Distress tolerance, mindfulness, these sorts of things that are trained um, like dialectical behavior therapy. It's getting at those things so we can learn to cope with what's going on with us. And I, and I wish I could see more of this, and maybe we will see DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. It's an evidence-based treatment modality. Come into schools. And help these kids kind of cope with all these added pressures they have, especially with social media. Everything's so immediate, you know? We know prevention is the key. If we can get that child before their first use, we can get that child um, before their first use of something super, super strong, then we know that we increase the likelihood that they're not going to be addicted later in life. We know that statistically. So here's the hope piece. While I was in prison, I journaled. The journals turned into stories. The stories turned into a book. The book is not for everybody. Um, but it's an example of where addiction can take us. And as I said earlier, in acting in a manner that isn't who we are as people. It can give parents and loved ones an understanding that addiction doesn't read resumes. It has nothing to do with that. Um, and it's also evidence that there's hope for getting better. There's hope for recovery. And by getting out and telling our individual stories or sharing them with a neighbor, you know, we're going to bring down that wall of stigma. The wall of stigma is still very much alive, and that's what's preventing a lot of people, including high school and middle school kids, from asking for that help. You know why? Because they're not, they're not an addict. They're not an alcoholic. Well, you know what? Let's change that terminology, how about, instead of putting a label on somebody. Why don't we refer to it as the addicted person? You don't have to carry that moniker your entire life or the alcohol addicted person, right? So we can remove some of those labels, you know, free up some of that language a little bit. You know, in, in terms of the stigma, I talked to a group in uh, North Adams, Massachusetts. I said, what are you talking about stigma? I mean, this is real. This is happening in front of us. You know, it's a star athlete, you know? It's, it's this one, it's that one. It doesn't matter who it is. Let's speak up. And when I talk to uh, groups and talk to parents, there's a ton of help out there. There's a ton of resources. Um, Friends of Recovery New York, um, Bob Lindsay's gonna speak. Tremendous organization, ACCA, tremendous organization. The resources are there and they're, here, they're also right here in our schools. 
Recovery is possible, but it takes work. And it takes work from all of us. You know, whether you're the addicted person or the family member of that person, it takes work, but the rewards are amazing. It starts with this little bright light, that first day clean and sober. You do the next right thing the next day. You go to a group. You go to a meeting. You find a sponsor, perhaps. You see a therapist. All of a sudden, the light gets a little brighter. Now you're holding doors open for people. You're not robbing people. You're not borrowing stuff from people. It gets brighter and brighter. Continue to, continue to grow in that recovery. And all of a sudden, the light's as bright as this light right here. And that's your life. You know, it's, it's vigilance. You got to keep your eye on the ball, but it's possible. And my final point is thanking everybody here because it's coalition groups like this. It's meetings at schools and families that are really making the difference. Um, and so thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. I have books on sale for $20 for a signed copy. They go to a nonprofit. Uh, the proceeds go to a nonprofit. Again, the book isn't for everyone. Remember, the worst happened over a decade ago. Thank you. I would like to now welcome Hector Fernandez, an Albany County drug investigator, to provide some information. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hector Fernandez. I'm an investigator with the Albany County Sheriff's Office. I've been an investigator for six and a half years. And to uh, corroborate what Andrew said, we do have one of the worst foods at Albany County Jail. Um, we run into people um, that once they know they're going to Albany County Jail, they're discouraged, uh, whether it's dealers, users. Um, and they want us to do them a favor and drop them off at Rensselaer County Jail or Saratoga County Jail, where the food is better where they may have an Xbox night or PlayStation night, we're not so much at Albany County Jail. Um, I've been an investigator for a year and a half. Uh, I mainly do uh, drug work. Uh, we have um, people that help us. Uh, we call them informants. Uh, they're people that, that, in a sense, we need in order to get to the dealers. Uh, I've debriefed dealers that sell heroin. There are dealers that sell crack cocaine. There are dealers that sell both. Uh, when I talk to the dealers and I ask them, are you, are you using? What drug are you using? They're not using any drug, but, but they'll sell it. And some of them will say, I don't use that crap, because they know it's crap. You know, and, it, and it's tough. It's tough for the people that are uh, under the influence of this drug, mainly heroin. It's tough to get away from the drug, that being so cheap, you can get it easily, easily in the streets. Troy, Schenectady, Albany, there's, there's places all over you could get this drug. Um, we've, I've had parents that I've spoken to that, that wish that we take their, their daughters or, or sons to jail. They, they want them to spend time in jail, like you heard our first speaker. It's my experience with these people that they'd rather their kids be in jail because in jail is where they will not have access to the drug. In jail is, is where they'll, they'll go through withdrawals, five days, six days maybe, and uh, we'll come across them and they're starting to, to go, they're starting to get dope sick is, is what they call it. And, and in order to make our jobs easier, we'll try to speed up the arraignment Right, because some of the symptoms will be um, using the bathroom uh, uncontrollably. Um, number three, uh, vomiting, um, all the, all these sweats, and uh, it's tough when you're in court, when you're transporting in in an unmarked car. You know, it's it, it's tough for us. It's tough for the person. We bring them to jail. It's tough for the jail too. They have to do a uh, hospital run with these people. And I've spoken to some of the CEOs, and I've asked them, what is it that you guys do for, for, for people that are coming through, through this withdrawal? And they say, you just got to let them go through it. And, and they feel like they want to die. You know, it's, I, I've never experienced it, but from what I've seen, it's tough. It's tough. Um, there was one uh, female that we had helping us out uh, 
from the city of Troy. Uh, she helped us out with a case. She then disappeared. She, she was in the streets uh, uh, selling her body, make, making money to then um, go to the drug. Uh, heroin was her drug of choice. She would also use crack cocaine. Uh, I found out months later that she got caught by uh, Troy PD, and now she was in jail, Rensselaer County Jail. After two weeks of her being in jail, I reached out to an investigator at Rensselaer County, and I went and visit. And we had a meeting, and she looked totally different. She was eating. She had put on 30 pounds in two weeks, you know, and, and, and she's a different person. You know, she, she, was, she was happy. She was happy. She was like, look at me, you know, a little chubby now, you know. Um, before that, she, she, she probably weighed like 100, 105 pounds, a um, little bit shorter than me. Uh, you know, sad, sadly enough, she did her time, three weeks, whatever it was for the charges, um, helped us out again, and then went back in the streets. I spoke to her mom, and her, and her, mom, her mom was genuinely upset, upset with, with, with the courts as to why they released her. Why? Why? When in, she needs years in jail. And it's tough as a parent, or to hear a parent wish that on, the, on their kids, but, but in fact, it's, it's, it's what would help, you know, especially with that drug, uh, heroin. It's tough for us, too, to test the drug. I know you guys have heard nowadays on TV where the drug is uh, laced with possibly fentanyl, uh, which is another drug. Uh, going back to what the dealers have told me, they don't use that crap because they know it'll kill you. Uh, they'll prep it with fentanyl. Uh, usually when the drug comes in, it'll come in as the purest form into the United States uh, with the big dealers, and then they'll go to the little dealers. They'll go through so many hands, and in order for the dealers to successfully make money, they're going to cut it up. They're going to they're, they're gonna dilute it with other powders, and you don't know what's in there. You go to the pharmacy, uh, you get some pills, you, you, you know it's... It's manufactured, you know it's controlled. You get drugs in the streets, you don't know what you're getting. Um, and, and, and the fentanyl is, is, is something where even us sometimes, we'll have to test it. We're like, we're like one of those little masks because you don't know. It, it could be airborne and it'll knock us out. You know, and it, it's tough, it's tough. And, and that's what's going in the veins. That's what's being snorted uh, through, through some of these people that that are, are addicted. It's, it's sad. It's sad. Um, I keep in touch with, with a lot of these people because I work with them. Um, they help us out, but, but it's tough. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of clinics out there that are helpful. Um, they'll go check themselves into a clinic, uh, and, and, and they may feel it's not working. After uh, they're done with the clinic, they'll go and try to score again because that's how they cope in their minds. That's, that's, that's what they need, whether they went through trauma or, or anything like that. That's, that's their escape route. And whenever they're sober and they go back to the drug, that's when the chances of overdose are higher because what they were doing before, maybe a bundle a day, and a bundle's 10 bags for those of you who don't know, 10 bags of heroin. They were doing a bundle a day. They'll go to rehab. They'll probably spend a couple weeks there, clean, clean themselves out, detox. And then they'll go back in the street, and they think that they can handle a bundle again. They'll go back to that, but their body doesn't have the same tolerance. And that's when you'll have problems. That's when you'll have the overdose and, and stuff like that. Um, from a law enforcement standpoint, we are trying. But, but I know there's not enough cops in the world. That there, when we take one dealer out, there's another one ready to fill his shoes. You know, and, 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 and it's tough, and, and I feel for those parents, you know, and, and, and even for, for the, the individuals that are, that are addicted to this drug. Um, crack cocaine, uh, I, I'm not trying to lessen the drug, but, but heroin is, is mainly where you see your overdoses. It's cheaper. Um, people that are under addiction, they'll, they'll steal from their family 
their, they'll pawn off their, their parents' jewelries. Uh, a lot of the burglaries that, that we're dealing with, um, I, I want to say 90% of it is tied to, to a drug user, you know, where, where they, just, they just need to get a hold of something to sell, to score. You know, and it's, and, and it's tough. It's tough. You know, it's, it's something we, we, we want to make a dent, you know, and, and we feel like we, we are sometimes, you know, but, but, but it's tough. You know, those programs, yes, ma'am. Like like clinics? No, in the jail. Oh, in the in in the jail there there are programs. I, I cannot speak much on that. Um, I, I don't I don't have the information you're, you're looking for. But I know I know at the jail uh, Sheriff Apple does offer uh, some programs to the inmates at at the jail. It's tough also um, with some of the medication that they give them. Uh, I know some of the clinics out like Camino Nuevo on, in Albany on Central Ave, uh, they offer, it's a methadone clinic where they use uh, methadone to kind of wean people off of the heroin. There's also clinics that offer Suboxone. I know at the jail it's tough what they can give to the inmates, but they do have um, the programs in place. Um, as far as withdrawals, it's, it's something that the person has to go through. They have to go through the withdrawals. They're, they're constant op, meaning that they're, they're constantly being observed by COs once they go through these withdrawals. They're constantly in the medical unit, and they'll also take them to the hospital as well to try to, to, try to help them out uh, with, with the pain. They just want to die, from what I gather, uh, whenever they go through the withdrawals. Um, but, but it's, you know, it's... It's tough. It's, it's a tough war. It's a tough war on drugs. You know, it's sad. You know, the, the deaths of overdose, it's, they're increasing. You know, and there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of work to be done. You know, but these dealers, they'll tell you, they don't, they don't use it. They just sell it. They're just trying to make a living in their minds. And, and they justify it. They don't care. If they feel, if they feel that uh, they, they deal to somebody who may be snitching on them, ratting on them, or talking to the police, they can, they can give you a drug or sell you a, a, a bag of heroin that's laced with something, and they know it. They, they can kill you. They have the power to do that because they know you as an addict are, are, are going are gonna to need the drug. You're going you're gonna to go and, and buy the drug. So they have that ability to do that. You know, it's sad. It's sad. You know, but, but we're out there. We're out there. I want you guys to know that. We're out there. We're, we're actively fighting the war on drugs. So. For some information items, I would like to welcome from the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, Peggy Bono. Did I say that right? Okay. I'm with the Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, and we oversee all of the state-run programs, all of the programs, there's about 1,500 in New York State that, if you can just stop there yeah, for one second, thank you, yeah. um, that provide um, treatment and prevention um, services. Um, so um, I thought I'd put together information that would be educational on what is heroin, what does it look like, what does treatment look like, and to hear it from individuals, um, young people, um, who were in your shoes. I see a lot of young people, who, young people in your shoes that they didn't start with heroin. Nobody starts with heroin. It starts with a backyard party, and it starts with weed, and nobody ever gets it. For some reason, they think that this is natural, and, you know, it starts with just what we think innocent substances. But if you're predisposed, who's to say who in this room is predisposed to addiction? So I'm going to share this video, and then I'll, I just want to very quickly highlight some of the resources that are available to you that are taxpayer resources. So they're free resources for you. So if we can go ahead.
Hello, I am Arlene Gonzalez Sanchez, Commissioner of the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services. I am pleased that you are participating in a discussion about substance use disorders. Prescription opiates and heroin abuse have increased and too many families have suffered loss from an opioid overdose. It is important to know that addiction can happen to anyone, any family, and at any time. I encourage all New Yorkers to learn the warning signs of addiction, how to access help, and to understand that addiction is a disease that can be treated. OASIS oversees one of the nation's largest addiction service systems with nearly 1,600 programs. Each day, 100,000 individuals are served by OASIS programs. I have seen positive outcomes when people engage in treatment and work towards recovery. Recovery is real. If you or someone you know is in need of help, please call the state's Hope Line at 1-877-846-7369. By watching this video, you'll hear firsthand stories about the impact of substance use disorders, especially the effect of heroin use and prescription opioid abuse on a family. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about this important issue. The denial was there huge, you know, not my child, this can't happen to him. Um, and I would say that any parent that's dealing with a, a child that has a substance abuse problem probably has some level of denial present because it's terrifying. If a parent is sitting there saying, not my child, I would uh, ask you to think, why not my child? You all have risk factors, they're in school. The face of addiction is not what it was in the 1970s. It is the high school cheerleader. It is the captain of the football team. It is anyone who you can think of could be that addict. You know, at one point I was an honor student, varsity athlete, and imagining myself, you know, away at college and living a beautiful life. And within just a couple years, I was stealing and committing criminal acts just to support my habit. At around the age of 15, he was smoking marijuana and drinking. We were past pills when I realized what was going on because that can happen so quickly. If you look at a normal teenager and a teenager that's abusing drugs, there's a lot of the same similar characteristics there, the, the non-compliance, the denial, the uh, defiance, the rebellion. So I just really thought a lot of it was about him being 13. He didn't get in trouble until he was 19, going into his sophomore year of college. He got arrested for possession of marijuana and um, controlled substances. My parents, I think, knew a little bit about my experimenting, and that's what they thought it was. They took it at that. She's young, she's just experimenting, you know, drinking sometimes. High schoolers do that. Smoking some weed, she's not really hurting herself. And they didn't really know about other things that I was trying, other drugs that I walked into and tried to do those. I, they didn't really know about that. Any parent that thinks, oh, they're only smoking pot and only drinking alcohol is crazy. My mom was more shocked than my dad because my dad kind of knew a bit more than she did. Their perception of me and who I actually was were two different things. And when she heard that I was doing heroin, it kind of like blew her mind a little bit. between the year that he went from eighth grade into ninth grade is when I really started to notice a real change. He would skip school and he was sleeping. And that was disturbing to me because why are you so tired, you know, and, and what is the, the isolating started to concern me.
came back from St. Martin, we were on vacation, we came back, we found out there was $4,000 missing from our bank account. And we said to him, Justin, did you take this money? Nope, I didn't take it. I can't tell you how many times we asked them. We said, you know, there's going to be a picture of you. If you took the money out of our ATM, they're going to have a picture of you. And he just denied, denied, denied. My husband went to the bank to look at the picture, and sure enough, it was my son. And it was heartbreaking. We really were, uh, it was really, we really didn't know, even know what to do. Spoons, spoons are such a big signal because they take heroin and they melt it on a spoon. So they're either going, you know, to inject it. Thomas would lie. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't take money, I didn't take jewelry. And you so want to believe your child when that's happening. I would rob anybody, to be honest with you. Anybody who ever, like, loved me or showed any compassion, such as my family. Like I said, long-term friends, I robbed a lot of people, you know? My family, to a point, I had no jewelry left. My family, I pull in their wedding rings. Right now, they just plug in. They're plugged in to video games, they're plugged into TV, they're plugged into everything, and then, they, and then they plug into a drug. And if you can't even unplug them from the TV, you're certainly not gonna unplug them from heroin. That's not gonna happen, not without some sort of intervention or help. Like, I used to be like a, like a all-star cheerleader. I used to be good in school, but like, I just like love the feeling of like, being high, like, like it just like overpowered all of that. Um, but like the thing about heroin is that like you just, you're emotionless, like after doing it for a certain period of time, like you have no emotion, like you're not, you're not sad, you're not happy, you're not, you're just like numb, you know what I mean? Like no emotion at all. So like I just didn't care. Denial is part of the disease of addiction, so the the family members will see a problem long before the addict does. So the addict will say, I don't have a problem, you know, I don't have a problem, but the family sees the change in diet, weight loss, uh, irritability, stealing, lying, all of those things that the, the addict needs to do to get their next fix. My grandmother, she came to me as well, and she says, oh, you're not playing sports this year? Like, why not? Because you're using heroin? Like, and I lied to her, too. And that's when my mom finally came into the picture, and she said, you need to stop lying. This is that, that mentality, that addiction mentality. You know, you're being a liar. You're sneaky. You're stealing. You're just doing all the stuff that normally you wouldn't do. And you have a problem. You have a serious problem, and you need help. There comes a point in addiction where I'm not able to choose whether or not I'm gonna use. And, you know, with addiction, I was willing to go to any length to keep chasing that. And I did a lot of things that I'm not proud of, did a lot of things that I said I would never do. And that's just how this disease works, it changes you. Justin was very anxious to get clean. When I tell you that, he didn't want to be a drug addict. He was very, very, he wanted to be normal. My son had the gift of gab. He was good looking, he uh, was smart, and he could talk to people like him. He was very personable. He didn't wake up one day and say, I want to be a heroin addict. He wanted to play Division I lacrosse, and that was something that he wanted to get back into doing. I didn't think it would happen to me, and it did. And just like it can happen to me, it can happen to you, it can happen to the next person, your best friend, your sister, your brother. Nobody's safe from addiction. Once we accept that the, that the adolescent has a, an addiction problem, we also have to accept that they could die from it. 
It, it goes together. You can't accept one without accepting the other. It's a progressive fatal disease. Heroin didn't kill Thomas. The disease of addiction killed Thomas. It's a club that no parent should ever belong to, and it's a nightmare that no parent should ever, ever possibly live through. Holidays are forever different in my house. Every second of every day, my mother's heart misses that boy more than anyone can imagine. That's my reality today. This is my son. And he OD'd and died. Every parent does everything they can do for their child. Um, it can happen to anyone. My kids couldn't, in middle school, couldn't go past two trees in front of my house because if I couldn't see them, they weren't allowed to go outside. I don't think there's any, I think people can't apply their stigma. They don't know their circumstances. Addiction does not discriminate as to who it affects. And that's what people really need to remember. You can be the best parent in the world. We had a very close, loving family, my, my kids. And it, it just happens. It's not a choice that they, you know, it, it happens. It just becomes a matter of being involved uh, in the recovery in a sense that you're involved in the recovery. I can't stress it enough. You have to go to the rehab if they're in the rehab. You have to go to the outpatient. If there's family classes you can take, if there's family resources, you have to find them. You need to step up and be a parent. You don't, your, your kids have plenty of friends. Don't be their friend. Be their worst nightmare. Question them. Drug test them if you have an inkling. They need to be aware, they need to know the dangers of what they're playing with. You know, sticking your hand in a bowl of pills and not knowing what you're taking because that seems like a good idea at the time. Well, you may not be so lucky as to just end up dead. You may be in a vegetative state for the rest of your life. If I could just go back and if I could say to any other parent that's dealing with this right now, if there's just anything I could do differently, it's that I would just get him unplugged. What parents can do is start asking more questions. You know, I saw a really awesome statistic released recently uh, that children whose parents talk to them regularly about the risks of addiction and alcoholism are 50% less likely to become addicted to alcohol or other substances. is not only talking to your children and telling them not to do drugs, but having real life conversations with them about the risks of drugs, about how easy it is to become addicted, and about what it's like to live a life of addiction, and how elusive recovery can be. They need to understand that, you know, if there's six of them sitting at a table, one of them may die from the disease of addiction. You know, two, two kids can drink a beer, and one will become an alcoholic, simply because of their genetics, or because you know, of, of what happens with inside their bodies. It's just another disease that we have to deal with. I'm there now to the day where I can talk to people about it. And when they tell me, oh, but you saw something, something must have gone wrong in your child um, that caused this, I can clearly state, no, I can't tell you to this day what caused this. It was. It's in him, and it's him, and that's okay. I have my own daughter, which is a precious and scary thing. And I know someday I'm gonna have to have these conversations with her. Probably a lot earlier than most will start these conversations, but 
I want to create in my household an environment where it's okay to talk. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to be curious. And when that time does come for my daughter, I want her to be able to talk to me and, and to my husband and know that addiction is a reality and that she's genetically predisposed to it. And that's something that she should be aware of before she gets to the point where she's with her friends and they're exploring their parents' liquor cabinets. There is hope. Your love, you brought this child into the world. And standing by them, with them, through this, there's the hope. You can't guarantee any tomorrow, which is really hard to hear. But I can tell you that I've gone through those really awful times. I've been on the streets driving around looking for my child. I've been out driving around just because the he's not picking up his phone. He's been gone for two days. I've gotten the call that the ER, he's at the ER and he's overdosed again. But I'm here to say that, you know, we've gotten through it. We're still here. He has a smile on his face. He's gotten married. There's hope. So I'm glad so many are still here. This is a long video, but there's an assignment with this, and that is, we're in school, so we can give assignments. Um, that is, there's an action step. With the kitchen table toolkit, which is what you just saw, part one, there's a part two. And part two is a similar video with more young people sharing their stories, sharing those backyard beer parties, sharing smoking pot for the first time. It's having that conversation, and they'll see firsthand real New Yorkers, real young people, sharing how it progresses so quickly. No one ever thinks it's going to happen to them. So what I ask of you tonight is to go on our website, oasis.ny.gov, and you will see front and center, it says Combat Heroin. Under that, it says Kitchen Table Toolkit. Click on that link. And there's these videos, there's a PowerPoint presentation. This is part of state ed's um, recommended curriculum for schools to adopt. So there's one video which you just saw for adults to become aware. And then there's a second video for having that conversation with young people. So that's your assignment. I encourage you to have that conversation. You're not alone in having this conversation because on the website you're gonna find a discussion guide. And the discussion guide says, if I have a 14-year-old, what are some questions I should be asking? When should I stop the, the vid video and pause and have a conversation? I have a 17-year-old. I have a 25-year-old. Have this conversation not once. You saw in the video, in the car, on the field, at the table, wherever and whenever. Make it comfortable. Don't make it a harassing conversation. Um, but these are real New Yorkers sharing their story, and they never thought it would happen to them. They're in recovery, they're doing well, relapses can be part of addiction, and um, we want to get rid of the stigma because it is a disease and it could happen to any family. Kristen, my heart goes out to you because it could happen to any single person in this, in this, in this audience tonight. So um, that's your homework assignment. and. Uh, New York State has, as you heard, thousands of programs. On any given day, there's 1,000 beds available in the state of New York. For years, people thought, there's no beds in the area. They may not be right here, but we'll find you a bed. And there's about 1,000 beds available on any given day. So there's services, there's new services, there's heightened attention to addiction. And uh, together, we're going to make a difference. So if we can save one life, that's 
very important. So thank you. Our last speaker for the evening, and then we will have a open up for a panel discussion um, and questions from the audience. Um, I would like to introduce Bob Lindsay. Among his many past experiences um, working with the Betty Ford Clinic as Director of Human Community Relations, to most recently retiring as the position of Executive Director for Friends of Recovery in New York, Mr. Bob Lindsay. Uh, okay, we're on television, so we need to have it on the mic. All right, so very simply, I want to just thank everybody for taking the time to be here tonight. Uh, the reality is you've got lots of things going on in your life. It's really important that you're here, and we, we appreciate the fact that you're here. One of the things that Kristen had asked me to talk about specifically was the issue of hope and recovery. And one of the things that I think that you heard throughout much of Kristen's comments as well as Andrew's comments, was about the importance and value of recovery, both for the individual and for the family. And I think that when we talk about addiction, we do a couple of things. Number one, we frequently focus just on heroin. And I hope one of the messages that you heard tonight is the issue is about addiction. And addiction is alcohol and all kinds of other drugs, including heroin. And the reality is the number of people who die on an annual basis, about 88,000 a year is alcohol alone. And about 44,000 plus is all other drugs combined. So just to kind of put that in perspective, and it's important that we do that. The other one to really talk about in terms of recovery is again, not just for the individual, but for the family. In too many cases when we talk about addiction, we talk about it solely from the perspective of the individual, not from the family who's living with it. And before the event started, I had a lot of opportunities to talk to a number of family members. And one of the things that I said to them, what's so critically important for you is to get connected to somebody who can help you learn about the nature of addiction, how it's impacted the person you're concerned about, and how it's impacting you as a family and what you as a family need to do to get the help and support that you need so that you're going to be best able to help the person you're concerned about. And fortunately, tonight we're joined by Nicole, who's the new family support navigator, um, which is really an important role. Everyone needs to know about Nicole and the support that she's providing through ACCA. Uh, the other one I just want to reference is Amanda in the back. Wave, Amanda. Amanda's here from Friends of Recovery, Albany County, and they're doing terrific work in Albany County to bring together the recovery community to really change public perception, not just of addiction, but also of recovery. And you've heard a lot about stigma and the negative perception associated both with active addiction as well as recovery. The sooner that we can break that down and break down the barriers that come with it, that uh, make it difficult for people to access treatment, access recovery supports in the community, the sooner we're going to be able to help more and more individuals. Estimates are 23 million people in this country live life today in recovery. That's phenomenal. The public has no idea that that's the case. For me, I have 11 family members live in life in recovery. 11 family members live in life in recovery. So that we, we know the reality of the fact that this can work. The other one I also want to do is leave you with additional homework, is to make sure that all of you are at Summer's Run on Saturday, May 13th. And that you bring other people to do the same. One of the things that's so unique about this run and the way that Kristen's put this together is that it's about raising awareness about addiction but at the same time, it's about celebrating the hope for recovery for individuals and families. The reality is if we're going to make a change here in Gilderland, if we're going to make a change here in Albany County, all of us need to step up and become involved in that solution by showing up at events like that, helping raise money, helping raise awareness. We desperately need that help and support. 
So that's my quick comment, and I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in addition to our presenters, I would like to invite Jennifer Victus, Victus, Victus I just butchered your name, from Addictions Care Center of Albany to join us in the panel for any questions um, and your expertise. I know we've, we've kind of uh, dwindled in our audience, but if there's any questions for any of our panel speakers.